So in this first video, we'll take a deep dive into SAE J1939 Controller Area Network or CAN network diagnosis using uh, an oscilloscope. Maybe something to mention first is something regarding ter terminology. For some off-highway techs, especially John Deere techs, you may not be familiar with the term J1939. Uh, this refers to the recommended practices which are produced or developed by the Society of Automotive Engineers. It's uh, recommended practices throughout the on-highway and off-highway uh, industry. Uh, this is for commercial vehicles, which include trucks and um, uh, ag equipment and construction and forestry equipment. Uh, throughout this video series, I'll probably um, use the two terms, J1939 and CAN, interchangeably, even though they are not exactly the same thing. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can uh, do a Google search on it, and uh, it will give you a better explanation of the protocol. But uh, for the purposes of this video, just uh, assume when I say J1939 or CAN, I mean the same thing most times. So this waveform that I'm showing here is a single J1939 CAN message. Two oscilloscope channels or inputs are being used. The yellow trace is showing the voltage of CAN high with respect to ground and the green trace is showing CAN low with respect to ground. So on a real machine, we would connect this typically to the 9-pin or 16-pin diagnostic connector. In this case, uh, I'm not using a real machine. I'm using Canalyzer to generate a single uh, 250K baud J1939 CAN message that is configured to appear that it's being broadcast by the engine controller. And this is the message that contains engine speed information. Here, each division of the time axis is 100 microseconds per division. Microsecond is a millionth of a second, so each of these are 100 microseconds. Uh, therefore, this entire CAN message takes about 530 microseconds to transmit at 250k baud. So if I zoom out by changing this time base, we can see that eventually I'm going to get to the point where I have um, enough time to be able to see more than one message being transmitted. So here I'm at a tenth of a second per division, and here I'm at two tenths of a second per division. So here is one CAN message. This is one second in time. Here is the next CAN message. So these are identical CAN messages. They're all containing the same information. Um, on a real machine, if you were connected to a real machine, um, within this same period of one second, I may have a thousand or more CAN messages being broadcast. So zooming back in on the message at our 100 microseconds per division, if I grab some of these uh, cursors and we can take a look at the amplitude, the voltage that we see, um, we can see that this is the zero volt point. So zero volts is located somewhere about right here. If I get it to stay there, uh, I can grab another cursor and we'll take a look. We can see that this is the two and a half volt level. So you're probably familiar with this. You've seen this before with your multimeter. This is where basically it's centered at. We'll just say centered for now. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at the maximum value that we see for can high while we're transmitting. And that is somewhere around 3.8 volts. Uh, conversely, let's take a look at can low. Of course, this is the same uh, 2.5 volt level and of course the same zero volt level. Uh, but we'll look here, can low drops down to about 1.13, something like that, uh, 1.12 volts, uh, somewhere in that region. Okay, go ahead and get rid of the cursors. I can add a math channel. Um, by adding a math channel here with PicoScope, I'm basically going to show what the waveform would look like if it were generated from can high minus can low. So if you would, this 2.5 volts minus 2.5 volts, obviously that's zero, and the 3.8 minus the 1.2. So let's take a look at what that waveform looks like. We can see that in blue. This is my um, uh, difference waveform. This is my math waveform. We can see that it's at about zero volts here, and we're at about uh, somewhere around 2.7 volts. So every time where we take the voltage of can high and we subtract can low, we create this digital waveform. So this is a digital waveform. It has two logic states, if you would. Basically, um, um, we'll, we'll call it a high and a low for now. The other thing that I can do with the PicoScope is uh, uh, I can add, we'll call it serial decoding. So J1939 is a serial communication bus. By serial, it means 
one event right after the other. So within time, we can see these ones and zeros that are, that are generated. So we have a choice of can. Well, we're not going to use that one. We know that what we care about in the off-highway and in the on-highway heavy um, uh, industry, we care about J1939 can. So we're going we're gonna to pick J1939. I'm going to pick can high minus can low. Uh, we're going to use a threshold for now. I'll go ahead and stick with these values. Uh, we'll leave everything else the way that it is. Go to the next page. And even though I don't usually use binary, I'm going to use binary, which is going to be ones and zeros. We're going to use that for our graph display form. And we'll go ahead and finish. And we'll just do the current buffer. It makes it a little quicker. And we'll go ahead and finish. So we can see down here is my decoded waveform. Granted, this is kind of hard to see. We're going to zoom in on this, and I'm going to show you. Uh, we can get the zoom out of the way here. Uh, we can see our ones and zeros, the individual ones and zeros in binary. And and as I told you, we have basically two logic states. Um, these before I said high and low. Let's call these instead um, dominant and recessive bits. So. When the difference between can high and can low is near zero, as in this point, we refer to this as the recessive state. So even though this is the recessive state and it has a value near zero volts, it's assigned a logic one. That may seem backwards, but this will make more sense once you see how can works. Conversely, the point where I have um, the difference between can high and can low is greater than approximately 1.5 volts. We refer to this as the dominant state. And the dominant state in J1939 is assigned, or in can, is assigned a logic zero. So once again, it seems opposite. You would look at this and most people would say this is zero, here's one, here's a zero, here's one. So if I look, I can see that I have instances where I have more than one zero in a row or more than one dominant bit in a row and I have more than one recessive bit in a row. Here I have four in a row of one state. Um, because this is a serial communication bus, it's all dependent on on time. So at 250,000 bits per second, if I take what's called the reciprocal of that, I'll find that each bit of a 250k CAN bus requires four microseconds. So let's grab a, a time ruler here and let's see if we can see what that four microseconds looks like. So here I'm uh, at, a, at a period of time. We can see that by the waveform. I'm going to look here and we're going to find that when I get to this point, if I look at this difference in time, so if I take this cursor minus this cursor's time, uh, they're in um, microseconds. Uh, I can I can see that that is four microseconds. So this is one bit at 250k. And in this instance, this bit starting off is a logic. Um, it, it is a logic zero. It is a dominant state bit. The very next bit, if I were to swing this over another time, another four microseconds over. Really hard to hit exactly, uh, but four microseconds seconds over approximately. There's the next bit. And conversely, on down the line for um, all 135 or so bits of this message, we can see every four microseconds we have a transition or we have a, a state. And, and the, the what's called the CAN transceiver, the device that is actually sending the message and receiving the message. So it's transmitting it and it's receiving it. It's called a transceiver. That device it knows in time what it expects to be able to measure every message. So you can imagine this message, this bit came through. From there, we start the clock at four microseconds. Within that time, I have to determine, is this a dominant bit or a recessive bit? Is this a, a zero or is this a one? Okay, so as I said initially, I would set the decoder so that it would use binary. As we can see, these ones and zeros might help you understand uh, uh, the CAN messages and the the elements of the CAN message, but it's really hard to 
to, to look at these ones and zeros and um, and to get much out of that as humans. Of course, the computers, the uh, the controllers, this is the language that they speak, but for us humans, it's, um, it's a little tough. So I'm going to go ahead and change the decoder. Instead of being binary, I'm going to use a format called hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is a base 16 numbering system, whereas decimal is base 10. Um, uh, we're, familiar with it. we're familiar with the numbers 0 through 9. Uh, hexadecimal uh, is the numbers, uh, it, it includes 0 through 9, and then it also includes a, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and so you've probably seen this before. Um, you you may, uh, may be familiar with it. You just didn't realize it was hexadecimal. Uh, we'll look at some examples of that as we go along. If you want to know more about hexadecimal number systems, um, you, can, uh, you can Google that and it'll give you all the information you probably ever want to know. So we'll go ahead and change this from binary to hexadecimal. So now instead of a bunch of zeros and ones, I can see that my decoded data is something that is um, more um, understandable by uh, people like me and uh, uh, computer science engineer. Um, and uh, it, it, it's something that allows us then to be able to see, in this case, something, the source address and the PGN, uh, the parameter group number. Uh, we can also see the other things, such as the priority of the message we talked about, as well as the actual data itself. So contained in this message, um, this is the engine speed message uh, contained within this message as defined by SAE, J1939 recommended practices. The engine speed information is contained within this data. And we'll, we'll kind of take a look at where that is and we'll change it virtually and we'll get an idea of what that does to our message because as i said this isn't real um, this isn't a real machine this is just a, a simulator that i'm using from canalizer just to help explain these concepts okay so what i'm going to do now i'm going to i'm going to change the virtual engine speed so the engine speed uses these two bytes of data it, that is the uh, defined by sae as to which uh, bytes contain the engine speed information. So I'm going to, right now, I've got the engine running virtually at 1,000 RPM. So I'm going to increase it by 1 RPM. Uh, so now I'm running at 1,001 RPM. So if you notice this byte of data, uh, previously was 4.0 in hex, now it's 4.8 in hex. So I'm going to go ahead and increase by another mile an hour, or, or um, RPM, and another, and another, and another. So now I'm at 1,005 RPM, uh, if this were a real engine, a real machine, the data would indicate 1,005 RPM. The tachometer on the machine would know to look at these, um, uh, the controller which contains the tachometer would know to be able to look at these two bytes of data and to know the engine speed. So I've added canalizer to the um, to the display here so that we can kind of see what's going on. Uh, this tool, canalizer, is transmitting this um, simulated engine speed message as though it were the engine controller it's transmitting it once per second you can see the time over here increment and every time it's the same message uh, so if i look up here this is the same data that the oscilloscope is now um, picking up on once per second it's pulling this message in and decoding it we can see it's got the same pgn the same parameter group number it has the same priority it has the same source address of zero and it has the same data. So if we look at these data bytes, the eight bytes of data, they're the same as the eight bytes of data that are up here. And as I indicated, now our virtual engine speed should be 1,005 RPM. So if we go ahead and pause, I'll go ahead and pause uh, Canalizer here, and we'll go ahead and um, take one of these messages and just decode it just to see. So we can see that this is the uh, decoded or um, scaled information not only decoded we're taking this information and scaling it so these two bytes the 681f 681f those contain the engine speed information and as i said that is 1005 rpm so if there were a tachometer on this machine if this were a real machine the tachometer would be indicating 1005 rpm because that's the message the engine controller is sending so that's probably enough for this video uh, i'll try to keep these short because i know a lot of these concepts are new to you uh, I will mention that if um, this is too simple for you and you want something that's more advanced, I have another series uh, on uh, J1939 Advanced uh, for technicians uh, that may be a little more suited for you. Um, if, if you'd like to know a lot more details about what I'm covering in this series, uh, there are videos in that series uh, that are on the same channel 
uh, which uh, I think I've got about 24 videos, which cover some pretty advanced topics, something kind of in between uh, engineering and technicians. So um, uh, I'll give you those two options. Um, and uh, I think that's it for this one.